And uh, welcome back. And it's a real honor for me to introduce a colleague and a friend uh, for our closing keynote lecture today. Dr. Deirdre Cruz is a nephrologist and associate professor of medicine in the Division of Nephrology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is appointed uh, in many uh, different uh, departments and institutes in the School of Nursing, the Welsh Center for Prevention, Epidemiology and Clinical Research, the Center on Aging and Health, and the Center for Health Equity, where she is associate director for research development. Dr. Cruz's groundbreaking research focuses on addressing disparities in the care and outcomes of kidney disease and hypertension. She is an elected member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and has received numerous awards for her research contributions, including the 2018 Johns Hopkins University President's Frontier Award, a quarter million dollar award granted to a single faculty scholar who is on the cusp of transforming their field. She is also a National Academy of Medicine Emerging Leader Scholar and was the inaugural Gilbert S. Ullman Anniversary Fellow of the National Academy of Medicine. In 2019, Dr. Cruz received the W. Lester Henry Award for Diversity and Access to Care from the American College of Physicians and the Distinguished Leader Award from the American Society of Nephrology. I've been incredibly fortunate to get to work with Dr. Cruz uh, at ASN she is the incoming program co-chair for Kidney Week 2021 and the immediate past chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, which uh, by all accounts is the, is the best committee at ASN. Um, today, Dr. Cruz will speak on a topic that is universally present and uh, with an urgent need and a call to action to deal with structural racism in medicine and research. So Deirdre, I'm absolutely delighted you're here with us uh, to talk about the pursuit of structurally competent kidney care and research. Thank you so much. I'm, uh, thank you for that really kind introduction, um, Dr. Quag, and it's um, been uh, terrific um, to work closely with you um, for, the, for the last several years um, through, through work through the ASN in, in particular. Um, and I'm thrilled to be with you all today. Um, and uh, you know, I was I was at Northwestern a, almost a couple of years ago now, and so it uh, it, it it does um, feel a little different to to do this via Zoom. But I'm I'm uh, very excited nonetheless uh, to join you for this uh, wonderful symposium. And so um, I will get started. Um, hopefully, my my uh, slides are shared there. Um, we'll be talking about uh, the pursuit of structurally competent kidney care and research. So I have no disclosures um, relevant to our uh, time together today. And um, for our, uh, as far as objectives, I really just have one objective um, today. And, and that has, for me, has been um, an objective that I've, I've kind of um, been focused on in, in much of my work of late. And that is uh, to seize this moment in time, this moment in history that all of us are, are living through currently um, to take the opportunity to highlight disparities in kidney disease, um, to name structural inequities and specifically structural racism as, um, as, a, as a root cause of, of these disparities, and to try to galvanize our community, our kidney community, towards structurally competent care and research um, that will move us closer to achieving kidney health equity. So um, as was mentioned, I uh, work at Johns Hopkins, um, but as it turns out, I actually live uh, closer to Washington, D.C. And, and live just about a 15 minute drive uh, from D.C. Um, and this photo here on the left um, is of Black Lives Matter Plaza. Um, and it has uh, really become uh, for the country really broadly, um, but certainly for our area here, has become a memorial in many respects to the lives that have been lost in uh, recent high profile acts of racism. Um, several of those lives, as, as you know, have been um, uh, lost at the hands of police officers, um, including uh, the individuals, most of the individuals who, who are in this photograph um, with um, George Floyd's uh, killing uh, in his photo here in the middle. Um, uh, really shaking the consciousness of, of, of much of, of the world over. And so, of course, at the same time, um, we have been and were previously already uh, dealing with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic 
um, where we've seen that um, there have been significant uh, consequences to, to black individuals um, in this country in particular, um, while there have been effects really on all of us. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, coupled with these uh, recent high profile acts of racism have had um, uh, really uh, tremendous consequences uh, to, to uh, black individuals. And here in this, this article that um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Tangela Purnell and I uh, wrote, we tried to highlight um, some of the consequences to black patients in particular, and really in thinking about our kidney patients. Um, and they include uh, tremendous grief um, that uh, many are experiencing during this time uh, while um, being in a situation where we're all socially isolated and can't um, turn to those sources uh, uh, where they might be able to receive comfort um, while, under, while experiencing this grief. Um, food scarcity has been a challenge in many um, uh, Black communities in particular. Uh, many have lost their employment and their, or their other sources of income. Uh, they've had difficulty getting their medications covered or other uh, accessing health care. Um, there have been uh, heightened fears of, of institutions, uh, broadly speaking, that have, have emerged during this time, including uh, uh, fears of um, the, the healthcare, uh, seeking healthcare and, and going into sort of the healthcare institutions because of fear of contracting COVID, but also with these high profile acts of racism, um, in many cases occurring in the setting of our, our justice system and an institution in and of itself, there have been just heightened fears around um, these issues. Um, because of this, there have been uh, care delays uh, that, and, and disrupted access to health care that many have, have had growing concerns about. Um, and of course, um, Black individuals have experienced greater COVID-19 illness and, and death um, in, in these last um, six months. And so I think important um, uh, framing uh, for our um, uh, time together today is to really think about um, the different uh, types of racism. When we talk about uh, racism and uh, structural racism, uh, which is where we'll spend most of our time, to think about um, kind of how this is sort of, these, are, these factors are sort of conceptualized. And this, this is a, 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 I think, very comprehensive um, piece that was written by um, Dr. David Williams and colleagues and uh, published less than a year ago now, where they um, kind of highlighted this in the framework of a house, and so that the house that racism built. So just want to highlight um, these three types of racism that I think will help us to think about how they show up in the healthcare setting and in specific how they show up in the kidney care and research setting. And so um, first there's cultural racism. And so this, um, this is the embedding of the inferiority of uh, black people in particular, um, but also other non-whites um, into the belief systems, images and norms of the larger culture that leads to negative beliefs um, like stereotyping and also negative attitudes like prejudices. Um, the um, institutional or structural racism uh, uh, sort of concept refers to societal structures and policies that reduce access of socially stigmatized uh, groups to uh, receiving opportunities and, and different resources. And so um, uh, when we look at individual level racism, and this may be what I think probably more of us may be more familiar with, um, these are experiences of differential treatment or discrimination that's directed at stigmatized racial groups, both by both social institutions and these can be uh, by uh, individuals. And so just as an example, um, uh, when we look at individual discrimination and we think about the healthcare setting, um, when if, if an individual has experienced um, individual level discrimination, then that might actually lead them to uh, be less likely to um, seek out care because they may be fearful that uh, that yet another experience with the healthcare system may lead to another experience of discrimination, um, and that can lead to then uh, avoidance of, of of care seeking and also in some cases avoidance of certain um, healthful behaviors that actually might uh, mitigate their their risk of of chronic illness and um, uh, improve their their overall health outcomes. And so next, what I'd like to do is to share um, some evidence of, of these forms of racism uh, in kidney disease. And I'll, I'll, I'll particularly highlight 
um, a couple of areas, those being um, this idea of individual level racism and some of the data emerging there in kidney disease. And then, and then we'll focus most of our time on structural racism. And so um, when it comes to individual level racism, um, there have been very few studies that have looked at this um, question and how it relates to uh, chronic kidney disease or to kidney function. Um, our group um, uh, did conduct a study uh, a few years ago where we examined uh, perceived discrimination and change in kidney function. And here we use data from the Healthy Aging in Neighborhoods of Diversity Across the Lifespan study, which is a bit of a mouthful, but it's the HANDLE study. And that is a, um, a uh, population-based um, study that is based, based in Baltimore. Um, the uh, population in the HANDLE study is roughly half um, uh, comprised of African Americans and roughly half comprised of comprised of white individuals, um, and uh, they, there's representation of both higher and lower socioeconomic status in the cohort. And so, in this study, what we were looking at were um, we examined self-reported perceived racial and perceived gender discrimination uh, across five different uh, distinct situations, and these included. Um, in circumstances related to school or, or seeking of education uh, in, in the setting of trying to get a job at work, at home, or when seeking medical care. We also um, uh, looked at a more global measure, a more general measure of the experience of discrimination. Um, and what we found, sort of the key findings of the study were that among white women, um, high experience of, of discrimination was associated with lower baseline kidney function in, in, in the study. Um, and among African American women, both perceived racial and gender discrimination were linked to lower um, follow up kidney function. So over time, which was an average of five years for most of the participants. And so um, this was this was one of the earliest kind of looks at um, perceived discrimination and kidney function. So since then, um, uh, Dr. Clarissa Diamantides and colleagues um, have uh, looked at um, a, a broader uh, array of, of issues, including uh, daily discrimination, but also looking at issues surrounding trust. And they conducted this study uh, using data from the Jackson Heart Study, which many of you may be familiar with, um, which is uh, focused on cardiovascular disease outcomes among African Americans um, living in, in, the, in the southern United States, primarily in the, the Mississippi uh, Delta region. And they were peer examining um, the use of routine medical care among African Americans who had um, high uh, uh, likelihood of developing CKD or, or were at high risk of CKD. Um, so this included over 3,000 participants um, who had who, who either already had reduced um, uh, kidney function, sort of reduced uh, GFR, um, or they had diabetes or hypertension. And they looked at um, uh, different sociodemographic factors, comorbid, comorbid disease uh, burden, healthcare access, and also a number of different psychosocial factors, um, including um, perceived discrimination, um, uh, feelings of anger, stress, and also trust um, in, in, in their healthcare providers. And they um, found that um, the, the when what they were looking at really was to see if these, these factors had a relationship with um, uh, uh, low levels of routine medical care use uh, in, a, in a sort of cross-sectional analysis. And so essentially what they found was that um, low trust in healthcare providers, um, high experiences of kind of everyday stressors, and also high daily uh, perceived discrimination were all associated with a low uh, routine medical, uh, low routine medical care use or sort of infrequent um, seeking of, of, um, of medical care. And here that was defined as they looked did kind of a look back where, where the um, participants were asked about whether they went in for kind of an annual physical um, in that preceding year. And these factors predicted not those, those participants not having sought that type of care. And so if you're curious um, about uh, how the stress of discrimination um, might uh, get under the skin, if you will, um, uh, one, one hypothesis is that uh, allostatic load is, is a factor here. And this allostatic load is um, defined as the cumulative impact of physiological wear and tear 
that's related to maladaptive adaptive stress patterns that can predispose uh, people to disease. And so this model um, highlights that um, uh, experiences like early childhood uh, adversity, um, experiences of living in a, in a um, marginalized uh, sort of social context, um, and also just exposure to other psychosocial stressors can influence the, um, uh, the body's stress response um, and can and also has a complex interplay with um, uh, the epigenetic signature that can actually uh, arise from that. And all of these factors um, then uh, play into the, uh, the allostatic load that, uh, that uh, an individual bears and that raises their risk of uh, cardiovascular disease in particular, um, in, including endothelial dysfunction and also atherosclerosis. You might imagine that while, while kidney disease was not included in this model, that we could easily kind of map um, it on to um, a similar model. And so this, this issue of allostatic load um, is also understudied in, in kidney disease. Um, but uh, the, the many of the same group um, as uh, Dr. Diamantides and others um, then looked at this, so led by uh, Dr. Joseph Lanyera, um, who um, again uh, did an analysis in the Jackson Heart study, and it was a very sort of elegant set of analyses. But I will um, highlight the main finding here, which was that um, the uh, they found this association in the study between um, allostatic load and uh, and, and kidney disease. And they also, I think quite notably, um, found that allostatic load appeared to mediate some of the association between um, a, a, the, the participant's lifetime socioeconomic status or sort of the, the, the level of, of socioeconomic status that they had experienced over the life course um, and its relationship to, to chronic kidney disease. So meaning that it appeared at least analytically in, the, in these models that allostatic load sort of sat in the middle of that and, and was a mediator of, of the effects that were seen downstream as far as kidney disease. And so I'm um, turning now to um, uh, residential segregation, which is um, a uh, key and a very impactful form of institutional or structural racism. So um, one of the, uh, uh, I think, key factors when we look at um, cities around the United States, um, uh, one of the uh, most kind of imp impactful ways that, that, that uh, we have seen uh, structural racism uh, and, and here specifically residential segregation emerge is through this practice of redlining. And so redlining um, uh, is a discriminatory practice uh, by which uh, banks, insurance companies, um, and others refuse or, or limit uh, their lending patterns uh, for things like mortgages or insurance uh, to um, uh, certain geographic areas, uh, usually in cities, and this is this is it's re has been especially noted in inner city uh, or urban um, neighborhoods. And so, um, as you might imagine, you know this this practice certainly can restrict those types of communities from uh, accessing loans to to start these types of to start businesses, and, and it also can restrict um, communities uh, from receiving certain goods and services. Um, in the United States, um, uh, Baltimore, which uh, again is, is of course where I work, uh, was one of the early um, cities to, to um, uh, develop this practice of redlining. And um, around really the, 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 the dawn of the 20th century, uh, redlining in Baltimore began. And this is one of those things that we, I'm, I'm told and, and through, through reading that this is something that, that Chicago actually adopted uh, uh, from Baltimore. Um, as, as did other cities around the country. And so I'm uh, sharing with you here some maps um, of, of various uh, cities. You'll see, you, you'll see Chicago there in the middle. Um, and you, what you'll notice those red areas, those are, were areas that were considered um, hazardous uh, areas for, for loans to be made. And, and, and for those, those lenders, um, those investors, they were kind of told to avoid um, making loans in those areas. Um, those areas were also um, uh, uh, predominantly um, inhabited by, um, by Black Americans um, and 
uh, in several cities, there were, there were discriminatory practices that restricted uh, lending to not only uh, uh, racial minorities, but also religious minorities, including uh, Jewish individuals. And this was particularly a practice in, in Baltimore. And so you'll see on the far right, this, um, this map of Baltimore, this, this large uh, red area here that I'll, I'll call to your attention that is by the um, uh, Patapsco Bay. And I just want you to remember, remember that um, space because this, this is a map from around, I think it's 1937, uh, and, and these other maps are around the same time period, the 1930s and 1940s. And then we will um, move to a more recent map of Baltimore. And um, you, you may be able to find that same bay um, from, uh, from the previous slide. And so it's notable, particularly considering um, uh, this history that, that uh, I just highlighted, that when we look at Baltimore now, what we find is that even just five miles uh, makes a world of a difference for health and, and health, health outcomes. So what I mean by that is when we look at um, this community that uh, is, is called Roland Park, which is um, a little bit of sort of north in, in Baltimore City, what we find is that it, uh, it's uh, pre predominantly white with, with around 80% of the uh, residents being white. It's a, um, a, a pretty uh, solid uh, median income of 90,000. Um, uh, there's only around a 3% unemployment rate. This, was, this is data from 2016. Um, uh, and there's a low homicide rate and there's a pretty high uh, life expectancy of 83 years and, and low, a low rate of death from heart disease. And so just five miles away um, in a community uh, known as uh, the Madison community or the East End community, it is a predominantly black community with a, 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 a third of a, the median income as, as Roland Park with high unemployment rate, uh, a high homicide rate, a 20 year difference in life expectancy, a 20 year lower difference in, in a, um, uh, a, a, a near, nearly three times a higher death rate from heart disease. And you'll recall that is the same community that I highlighted um, in the previous slide that uh, was um, marked as being undesirable um, during the heightened area of, of redlining, which uh, unfortunately that, that practice um, still at, at low level still does exist in a number of cities. And so um, this issue of, of community level um, poverty in particular um, is of great importance to, to those of us uh, in the kidney community. Um, and uh, this, this study by um, Dr. Garrity and colleagues, I know several colleagues are uh, based in Chicago um, uh, that were included in this, in this um, paper. Um, and what they were looking at here uh, was um, they were on the, the right-hand side, they were looking at the, the general U.S. population and they were looking at uh, levels of, of um, area level poverty. So meaning that uh, communities who had more than 20% of their residents uh, living below the federal poverty line. And so around that time, a federal poverty line is around um, uh, $25,000 for a family of four. So uh, families that have, that have who, who fall below that, below that level. Um, and so these, in, in, in the, the earlier period that they looked at, they found that in the overall U.S. population, um, that around 11% of, of people lived in those types of communities. And then in the more recent period, the, in here 2005 to 2010, there were about 12 and a half percent of individuals who lived in communities like this with um, uh, kind of a high burden of, of poverty. Um, and then if you look here to the left-hand side, you'll note that um, the incident or new dialysis uh, patient population was examined as well. And you'll see that um, uh, fully a third of the of the incident dialysis uh, patients in in the United States were noted to be uh, dwelling in these types of communities, and so we really do serve a um, a uh, population of individuals who are heavily burdened uh, by poverty. And so, um, as you might imagine, in this in these settings of uh, where there has been residential segregation in, in many cases as a consequence of the practice of redlining, um, many individuals um, 
uh, may uh, have difficulty accessing and maintaining um, uh, safe places to live. And um, while this uh, is yet another area that certainly deserves more attention, uh, Dr. Tessa Novick um, and, and I and other colleagues um, have looked at um, the issue of housing insecurity and how it um, uh, relates to the development of kidney disease. And here we again use data from the Handel study uh, using, uh, which again is inclusive of, of people living in Baltimore. And housing insecurity was defined as um, a negative response or a no, if you will, to the question of are you able to afford a suitable a home suitable for you and, and your family? Um, in this study, 32% of the participants uh, said that they uh, said and actually answered um, no, that they're, they're not able to afford a suitable home, um, indicating housing insecurity. And what we found is that over um, three and a half years of follow up in the study, 16% experienced rapid kidney function decline, 16% of the overall population experienced uh, rapid kidney function decline, 5% developed um, uh, new cases of, of, of uh, kidney function uh, below 60 or uh, estimated GFR below 60, and 7% developed albuminuria. Um, notably, housing insecurity was associated with the development of albuminuria um, but it was not associated with these other um, these other kidney outcomes. Uh, but certainly, this we thought that this study uh, did provide at least some uh, some evidence that um, housing insecurity does have some relationship with the burden of kidney disease that that we see. Um, in the same cohort, uh, we um, looked at. Uh, a, a population of people already with CKD, so people with um, reduced GFR or albuminuria, uh, around 350 of them, and examine the relationship between um, experiences of housing instability or housing insecurity and um, their level of engagement with, with, um, with the healthcare system. And uh, we here used sort of a couple of different questions to define housing instability, including the earlier one around a suitable home, but also asked about, um, uh, included a question around, um, have you had difficulties in making uh, rent or mortgage payments? Uh, we found that 38% of, of, of this um, population, so a third of these people with uh, CKD, um, did uh, say that they were uh, having these, these challenges. And um, around a quarter of them reported postponement of medical care. And, and when we went on to do some, um, uh, analyses including uh, statistical adjustment for a number of different factors that may have a relationship with either uh, their socioeconomic status and their, you know, thus their ability to, to access a home and also um, things that are related to kidney disease. We found that housing instability was, was an independent uh, predictor. It had an independent relationship with, um, with kind of postponing uh, seeking medical care among people who had CKD. And so, um, of course, another really um, another issue that's really important in CKD um, that can be heavily impacted by residential segregation um, is nutrition. Um, and so, in this model um, by uh, Dr. Orlando Gutierrez, um, what is just outlined are really all of the different factors that come into play when determining the nutritional status of, of, of people who have chronic kidney disease, including things like the availability of grocery stores, the ability to, to get there using you know, transportation, um, the, the amount of kind of competing types of foods that are around competing with those healthy foods, so the density of, of fast food restaurants that might be in a community. Um, closely tied to nutrition is uh, uh, physical activity, of course, and so the accessibility of places to exercise can be a key factor. And then finally, individual purchasing power. So the, the, just the um, uh, amount of income uh, that, that a person has uh, that, that will influence what they're able to, what and whether they're, they're able to access food. And so um, my colleagues and I have done a number of um, studies in, in, the, in the last uh, several years, really trying to better understand um, some of these challenges that uh, particularly low income individuals and, and much of our work has been focused on low income African Americans and, and what they may be experiencing when it comes to nutrition and um, thinking about how they can either um, prevent themselves from developing kidney disease or, or, or 
to make modifications such that their existing CKD doesn't progress. Um, and so this is one study that we conducted, which was a qualitative research study, where we um, uh, recruited um, uh, low-income African Americans who had a first-degree family member with end-stage kidney disease, um, and these individuals in our study also had themselves some risk factor for developing kidney disease such as diabetes or hypertension. And what we were focused on was um, sorting out their views on um, what would be important factors surrounding their ability to be able to make dietary changes in order to try to prevent themselves from developing kidney disease in the same way that their first degree family member had. And so some of the, some of the, the things that were highlighted were that um, healthy foods are expensive um, and unavailable in certain neighborhoods. Uh, one of the participants uh, noted, um, they said, in, in what, and what we have in our neighborhoods and most low-income neighborhoods is fast food restaurants everywhere. You hardly see a farmer's market or fresh produce stand or even fresh produce in the supermarket. And as soon as you walk in the market, the first thing you see is cakes, cookies, chips, cereal with loads of sugar. Um, and so they're, you know, really highlighting this access issue. And then they went on to note that um, unhealthy foods are more convenient in their community. And also they're, they're, um, they're also more convenient for preparation um, as well. And that unhealthy dietary patterns have been a lifelong habit uh, for them uh, and might be therefore quite difficult to break. In a more recent um, uh, study that we've uh, conducted and are, and are writing up at this point, it's led by um, Dr. Anika Hines. Um, we uh, have been using this discipline called Photo Voice, which is a qualitative research discipline where the participants are um, trained to use uh, cameras to go out and actually document the um, uh, document uh, something in their environment. In this case, we were focused on food. Um, and that those photographs are then used to um, spur discussion and also used for advocacy. Um, and so in this case, uh, as I mentioned, we've been, we're, we've been focusing on food and um, among individuals who uh, either already have early kidney disease or have uh, risk factors for kidney disease. Um, and uh, this gentleman, uh, his photograph that he took was uh, three cucumbers and a tomato. Um, he is um, someone who has a has a garden that that lower uh, right hand picture um, is a is a garden that he has in, in his home uh, at his home. Um, and um, here's a quote from him. Uh, he said, I, I tried something I saw at a store at home. It saved money and it was good. It's complicated to try uh, to shop. Uh, people with cars can get around. People in the neighborhood have no access. I try to help when I can. Concerns about crime and safety. If it was easier to get stuff, crime would decrease. And so he's sharing, you know, some insights that he's gleaned um, in, in his community and some of the challenges that he, uh, he, has, he has seen uh, that he, he himself has been able to, um, uh, to come up with a, a solution uh, to try to eat healthier through growing his own food. And so another major challenge, uh, particularly impacting a number of um, uh, Black Americans is the issue of food insecurity or the inability to afford uh, nutritionally adequate foods. And um, we know that uh, if you look at the, the figure here, we know that um, uh, both Blacks and, and Hispanics are disproportionately affected by food insecurity. And um, what we have seen over, over the last couple of decades is that in times of great uh, economic stress for the nation, that there are spikes in food insecurity. And so we saw this during the Great Recession. By all indicators, we will see this now in, uh, here in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so um, my colleagues and I, led here by uh, Dr. Tanishri Banerjee, um, have conducted work examining the relationship between food insecurity and chronic kidney disease. And, and in this case, we were looking at um, uh, a population uh, in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES, um, who, who had CKD at their, at their NHANES assessment. And we looked to see if, um, if having food insecurity, for if, if those individuals with food insecurity um, were then more likely to develop in-stage uh, kidney disease, and indeed they were. So that, that uh, top red line uh, was the group who 
um, had food insecurity uh, at their assessment in, 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 in Haines. Um, food insecurity uh, is often in a number of, using a number of sort of survey instruments can be assessed by asking questions around whether an individual has had to skip meals because they um, didn't have enough money to, to buy food, uh, among other questions that, that can be asked to glean food insecurity. And so in the, in the same study, we went on to then try to um, uh, examine uh, in, in sort of using, looking at multiple potential confounders um, to look at the um, potential independent relationship between food insecurity and progression of CKD. Um, and notably, what we found after adjustment for a number of factors, we did find that the inclusion of nutritional factors. So here we included um, their total caloric intake um, per day, their body mass index, and also uh, dietary acid load. Uh, uh, and by including those factors, we found that we were actually able to, at least statistically, um, uh, eliminate that that or, or, or account for that relationship between uh, food insecurity and the progression of CKD, um, which actually um, did give us some hope that um, that uh, for individuals who are experiencing food insecurity, that addressing the nutritional uh, component of, of what of, of what they're dealing with might actually lead to favorable outcomes uh, for uh, their kidney function. In uh, further work, we um, examined um, uh, uh, non-Hispanic Black uh, and non-Hispanic White uh, individuals in the NHANE study, and we looked at um, dietary acid load here. And so as you are likely familiar, um, uh, dietary patterns that are uh, uh, rich in fruits and vegetables um, tend to have a lower level of dietary acid load, while, is, while those um, dietary patterns that are more based in uh, animal-based uh, uh, foods, whether that's meats or, or uh, eggs, uh, cheese, those have a higher dietary acid load. Uh, our group had found in previous work that, um, that uh, Black individuals um, were, had, a, had a higher dietary acid load. Um, which, which was similar to what has been found in actually a number of different studies. And here we were looking to see the relationship between the progression um, of, um, looking at the relationship between dietary acid load and kind of risk of, of developing in-stage kidney disease um, among people already with, um, with CKD. Again, this is in the using uh, data from NHANES. And just want to highlight that what we found was that this relationship between this sort of finding of dietary acid load being detrimental, if you will, for um, uh, progression of, of, of kidney disease was particularly notable among, uh, among Black uh, individuals. And actually, this, this in some ways uh, has an interesting relationship to what has been found in studies of the DASH diet uh, that have found that it, that for um, uh, people who follow a DASH-like diet, the blood pressure lowering effect and other benefits are actually even more uh, strongly noted among, uh, were strongly, more strongly noted among Black individuals. And so, um, so this was a, an interesting finding to us. And so um, we've gone on to, with that work as a backdrop, to, um, to really try to uh, now conduct a clinical trial that's trying to address some of these structural inequities that um, uh, particularly low-income African Americans may be experiencing. And so we are currently conducting a clinical trial called the Five Plus Nuts and Beans for Kidneys trial um, that builds upon a um, a successful pilot study that uh, uh, was a, just an eight-week trial among uh, people who had hypertension, not necessarily focused on kidney disease. Um, but what it is, is a, uh, in our case now, is a 12-month community-based uh, dietary intervention study uh, among 150 low-income African-American participants who have uh, both hypertension and they have albuminuria. And what we're doing is we're testing whether um, providing nutritional advice around adopting a DASH-like diet, which is, which is, of course, low in dietary acid load, um, and also um, providing $30 per week worth of um, uh, potassium-rich foods um, and tailored to the personal choices and, and of the participants um, will ultimately lead to reductions in uh, albumin excretion and also reductions in blood pressure. We are partnering with a local uh, grocery chain to provide those foods. 
And so, as I mentioned, this is a 12 month study. Um, it has uh, two arms, one that um, the, the self-directed uh, arm um, gets a gift card for the same amount of groceries as the, uh, the arm that gets the coaching. Um, in the first phase for both groups, they get a provision of either a gift card or the food delivery. But in the second phase, they, um, the self-directed group gets, gets you know, no coaching and no gift card while the group that's receiving coaching does continue to get some telephonic uh, visits. This is a, um, a community-based participatory research study, and we have a number of community partners and stakeholders that are engaged in this with us. And um, one of the key principles of, of um, CBPR, as it's abbreviated, is that um, the um, these types of research studies are co-developed by the, the various stakeholders in, in concert with the investigators, um, generally speaking, you know, people, people, people who are working in academic settings, um, and they, they develop the questions together, they come up with the, um, with the plan to kind of answer it and, and develop the interventions. And so our community partners have been with us throughout the entire process of the study, uh, which is ongoing. We have about another year uh, to, uh, before we have completed the study. And so as we, um, I think, you know, I've, I've provided hopefully a, a backdrop of some of, some of the disparities that have been noted in, um, in kidney disease. Um, but as we, I think, try to move from a place of, of health disparities, uh, which of course are these preventable differences in, in burden of disease, um, uh, injury, violence, or opportunities um, that can be experienced by, by socially disadvantaged populations. Um, as we move towards a place of health equity, uh, and, and specifically kidney health equity, um, where um, every person has the, the full opportunity to attain their, their full health potential, um, I think there are, um, we, we really have to kind of keep in mind the role that um, these structural inequities and in, in, in specific structural racism in the case of our efforts around uh, equity as, as, as experienced by, uh, by uh, Black individuals and other um, people of color, I think it's going to be key to keep those factors in mind. And so some of the um, approaches that can be taken uh, to reducing uh, racism and also enhancing uh, trustworthiness um, in, in healthcare and research um, are, are outlined here, and they include um, uh, uh, efforts around um, delivering relationship-centered care, and so that a lot of that begins with um, an awareness of our own uh, implicit biases, for example, um, and developing um, greater um, knowledge of the experiences of, of, of our patients, as well as our research participants and our colleagues, um, using more participatory communication, kind of inviting uh, the people that we're, we're uh, communicating with through our work um, to, to be much more engaged uh, respect is a central tenant there, um, and also shared values. Um, that that type of care delivery, uh, you know, clinical care as well as research, certainly can help us to move closer to um, uh, uh, having trustworthiness or earning trustworthiness from our um, our patients as well as our research participants, um, because we it's it's one way of sort of demonstrating. Uh, that we have benevolence, benevolence and, and, and integrity. Um, structural competency, we will talk a, a bit more in detail about, and it um, is uh, an awareness of, of health inequities, um, so including some of the, some of the things that we've, we've talked about today, um, and also an awareness of social injustices. Um, it involves authentic community partnerships. So it means that, you know, as I outlined, you know, in our effort with our, with our current clinical trial, where we are, um, you know, partnering with, with our stakeholders in the community to, to, to co-develop the, the work that we're doing and to co-conduct that work. Um, and then it, it involves um, organizational transparency. So that, you know, even, you know, at the, at the highest levels of our healthcare system, our, um, our, um, our research uh, uh, institutes, for example, being really, really kind of transparent about the work that we do so that the communities that we're serving are clear about what our intent is um, and, uh, and also are, are gaining new knowledge as we are gaining new knowledge, that, 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 that they are also being provided a greater understanding of um, where the work is going. Um, structural competency in research in particular involves 
uh, I think it requires a, a need for more funding for health disparities uh, work. Um, I think their health disparities, including in kidney disease, have been documented now for, for around three decades, um, uh, but there have, has been less uh, uh, pouring in uh, as far as funding into the conduct of interventions that are being tested to actually try to move us uh, closer to solutions to some of these um, disparities. And, um, and then finally, uh, structural competency necessarily requires participation of a diverse group of individuals, including at, at the level of leadership. And so many of you may be familiar with this idea of cultural competency. I think certainly those who have worked, uh, who work clinically um, have probably undergone um, uh, training in cultural competency. Um, this, this move or this idea of going from cultural to structural competence um, is one that um, really focuses on having the ability to understand how health disparities are driven by the both institutional and societal levels. Um, and, and the ability to kind of take that into account in our work with managing patients and their, their, um, their health conditions and also conducting research. Um, it broadens uh, the way that we think about um, cultural competency to include a really uh, much more rigorous uh, recognition of the role of social determinants of health. Um, it uh, recognizes that these structural factors can shape both patients and health professionals. So our, our very colleagues are are often dealing with many of these same structural inequities um, that, um, that, that our patients are experiencing. And so that awareness uh, is really key to, to uh, becoming more structurally competent. And it really rearticulates in many ways um, cultural factors in structural terms. So I think um, in many cases, when we see patterns among certain groups, like whether it's in this case, we've been talking a lot about um, uh, black Americans, right? And when we see certain patterns, I think there's been a tendency uh, both kind of colloquially and also even in the literature to assert that um, those patterns are due to culture and sort of um, cultural differences, cultural variability. And it really, the, this focus on structural competence really uh, forces us to think about what structural uh, factors are at play that are driving what, what we see at, in these patterns that we, that we see among populations. Um, it, it requires and asks of us to develop structural humility. And so by that meaning that um, we uh, acknowledge uh, and we have this orientation that, that emphasizes collaboration between patients and populations in developing these responses to these issues rather than sort of assuming that we as investigators or clinicians um, kind of have the answers and that we know, we know uh, what the best approach is. And then finally, it requires um, that we all use our power and our privilege to advocate uh, for change. And so in kidney disease, uh, we, we are at an exciting time in that we have, um, I think, a number of opportunities for um, enhancing structural competence in, in kidney care and in research. And that uh, one place is when we think about uh, the Advancing American Kidney Health um, Executive Order that was signed uh, last July. Um, and um, in this, this um, piece uh, published in, in seminars and dialysis, um, Dr. Novick and I tried to outline um, in looking at the, the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative in the four key uh, areas, the, 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 public health, the Public Awareness Initiative, the um, ESRD treatment choices uh, model, the transplant proposals, and also the, 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 the um, aim towards developing an artificial kidney, that there are, um, there are certainly potential benefits um, of, many potential benefits of these, of these initiatives. There are also some potential uh, negative consequences or unintended consequences. Um, and then we tried to highlight ways that um, the negative, the potential negative impact, particularly on socially disadvantaged uh, uh, populations, uh, how that negative impact might be mitigated. And so just as a, to highlight a couple of examples, um, when we think about this, uh, the ETC as it's abbreviated, the, the mandatory model, um, you know, the goal, and I think the, a, a highlight is that um, the goal is towards coordinated efforts to educate and prepare patients for home dialysis and transplantation. And it's an opportunity to test different approaches really for, for addressing inequities. Um, the, uh, the some potential negative uh, outcomes could be that facilities and nephrologists may be disincentivized to actually treat socially disadvantaged uh, patients, um, and home dialysis as well may not be feasible for for 
for patients who are experiencing housing insecurity um, or those with limited family or social support. And so one way to potentially uh, mitigate that is by building in monitoring for these uh, potential threats to access to care, encouraging the providers to um, individualize care that's aligned with patient uh, preferences. And then uh, we, in my view, need to enhance our efforts to address um, the social needs of dialysis patients to uh, make sure, for example, if someone is dealing with housing insecurity, that they are connected with resources that might help them address that and then also might increase their ability to pursue home dialysis. Uh, when it comes to, I know this is an, this is an innovation uh, uh, symposium today and you know so thinking about uh, developing a, an artificial kidney and so um, certainly this is very exciting um, and could lead to um, enhanced uh, life participation for um, people with kidney disease and, and, and particularly uh, kidney failure. Um, uh, socially, the challenge though is that socially disadvantaged individuals access to this innovation may lag behind that of others. And um, so really, it will be really key to seek input uh, on product design and dissemination um, from members of socially disadvantaged groups um, as, as these types of innovations are developed. And so um, to summarize um, what we've covered, so we really are, are at an inflection point for uh, racial injustice and health disparities in this country. And uh, racism is a, a root cause of, of um, many of the observed uh, racial disparities um, that we see, um, but we really do have an opportunity to enhance our structural competence in, in each of our settings. So whether that's in the clinical setting or the research setting towards achieving kidney health equity. And so I will, um, I will end there and I'll thank you. I wanna acknowledge um, my colleagues at the Center for Health Equity at Johns Hopkins where we're celebrating our, our 10th year. Um, and um, I look forward to your questions and to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Cruz. Uh, it was a very, very informative uh, discussion. And, and we have quite a few questions. Um, so the, the first one is, uh, what are key immediate steps that can be taken to start intervening? Start intervening, for example, disrupting the cycle of allostatic adaptation. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen just so I can. <laughs> um, so. I would say I always encourage people to, and I think in this time, there's so much energy around like, what can we do, right? And so I always encourage everyone to um, start where you are, right? So think about your own, think about your own setting um, and your own, um, uh, whether it's uh, your patients that you're taking care of um, or whether it's your, um, your research work that, that you're doing, start, you know, start your own institution and um, really look for places where you could either um, enhance your understanding, so through um, trying to uh, gain a better understanding of the experiences of whether, again, whether it's patients, uh, research participants, research collaborators even, um, and, and then try to sort of build out from there is what I would encourage. Um, as far as the as far as the allostatic load piece, so allostatic load is, um, and in, in the way that it was applied in those, um, in the study, that I highlighted, there are kind of there are eleven different uh, factors that kind of go into play into, into at least the way that we estimate allostatic load. Um, many of them are things that would be familiar to us. So uh, whether it's high cholesterol, that's that's one of them. Whether it's um, uh, hyperglycemia or sort of poor, poorly controlled um, uh, diabetes, right? So that that's one that falls in it. There are some measures that we don't typically um, uh, capture in at least not in the general clinical setting. Um, like um, uh, some measures, some hormones, actually some some uh, some hormone re release, uh, cortisol, for example, that is a can, that that can be be elevated in the setting of stress. And so, um, I think understanding that that may be the, the, the confluence of that may be what we're seeing when we start to see cardiovascular disease. I think is important, um, but um, trying to uh, you know, understand individual on the individual level, I would say with a patient trying to understand um, better what their actual experiences are and uh, what barriers they may be facing, I think is, is a good first step. Uh, the next question, uh, will five plus nuts and beans uh, also follow urine potassium with albumin? Yes, so we are, we are capturing uh, urine, potassium, sodium, 
and the albumin. And, and also we're in creatinine, you're in creatinine as well. And then uh, what more can be done to recruit medical school students, interns, residents uh, with a strong interest in social justice is issues to enter nephrology and work on issues highlighted in the presentation? Oh, so um, I'm working as hard as I can. <laughs> so that's the first thing, <laughs> but to try to recruit them. Um, so I think I, I, when, whenever I think about uh, as, uh, as a nephrologist in, in, our, in, our, you know, in our field in general, when I think about how we can attract more people, I, one, of the thing, one of the things that I turn to is um, that I think it's so important to show them the breadth of what we do. And so I think um, so few medical students get exposure to um, even, even understanding the, the profound um, disparities that exist in kidney disease. And so I think, um, for example, incorporating that into their their uh, medical school education and when they're when they're covering their kidney block um, in their education highlighting that we have our curriculum at at uh, Hopkins is called genes to society um, so we trace uh, in the in when we're, when we're covering the kidney section we go from everything from genetic disorders um, all the way up to the societal impact of, of kidney disease uh, covering you know the story of Medicare coverage for in stage kidney disease and the like. Um, and so we really do try to give the students a broad range of, of uh, all different types of things that are going on in, in, our, in our discipline. And I, and I think that's one approach. Uh, and uh, last question I think we'll have time for uh, today. Uh, uh, diet interventions are so important for kidney health. Uh, so many dialysis units exist in the midst of food deserts. Uh, shouldn't the provision of healthy food and diets be provided in all of these places, mandated for the LDOs to provide a percent of their profits toward prevention efforts? Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, wow. So I um, so I would love to see that latter <laughs> that latter piece as far as the 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 uh, the large dialysis organizations providing uh, support there. So I agree, and I, there have been uh, I, I definitely agree on uh, the the point that yes. Um, I could I could have shown a map of the, the placement of dialysis units also, um, and I bet it would line up quite a lot with with the those those redlining maps. Um, so you know there have been a couple of um, interventions that have been tested, like of this sort of providing lunches at um, or meals at dialysis. They weren't so much focused on trying to overcome food insecurity in, in, in that patient population as much as it was sort of testing manipulation of the diet in different ways. You know, if they provided a low phosphorus diet or they, uh, you know, provided a low potassium diet to, for people that were having um, those kind of challenges. But yes, I think that, I think that would be a great idea. I think our, um, there are some colleagues in uh, pediatrics that are, have, have been given some thought to that. Dr. Michelle Starr is someone who comes to mind who, who's very interested in food insecurity in the pediatric nephrology population and has some interest in exploring that type of thing as well. So, um, so yes, I, I like that idea. Uh, well, I think that's all the questions we have time for. Uh, thank you again for taking the time to join us today. I know you're on service, so uh, really uh, appreciate you taking the time uh, away from your clinic uh, to, to speak to us on this very important topic. And thank you for all the work that, that you do to, to move uh, kidney health equity and health equity forward. Um, I'll invite Dr. Quaggan uh, back on um, to kind of take us, take us home with some closing remarks from the day today. All right. Well, thanks, Ashley. And uh, Dr. Cruz, Deirdre, thank you very much for a fabulous talk. It was absolutely inspiring and a lot of work for all of us to do. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to thank all of our speakers uh, from today, Dr. Drucker, our wonderful panelists, uh, Dr. G., uh, Dr. Title, and Dr. Cherney. Um, of course, all the participants who've been here with us today, our poster presenters who all did a fabulous job. Um, I'd also like to thank our technical crew, uh, Katie, Junaid, and Anthony. And most of all, a huge thank you to Ashley, who is a phenomenal operations and outreach administrator at the O'Brien Kidney Center. Um, this couldn't have been possible without her. Um, we're really hoping to be able to do this again next year in person. And uh, everybody have a wonderful evening, stay safe. And remember, we'll have this uh, 
available for registrants uh, for some time um, with recordings. Have a terrific evening and thanks for joining us today.